Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fridays with Keenan's Cutting Edge. I am so sorry we are supposed to be live right now, and you know what? It just did not happen. The weather in Florida is creating some kind of a, an issue with the Wi-Fi, so there's not enough of that to... I guess, show us to you all live. So I'm so sorry about that. But um, those of you who intended to join us live, if you feel like you want to leave comments in the comment section below, we'll do the best we can to go back, circle back to this episode and get those answered. But we will also leave Amy and David's contact information in the description below so that you can uh, hopefully obtain a more expedient answer uh, by emailing them directly. So... Nonetheless, even though we are not live today, please hit the subscribe button, do all of the things that you normally do to make sure you don't miss an episode when we have it together enough to make sure it's live. And uh, we're going to get started. We've had Amy and David on the podcast before. Welcome back, you guys. Thank you so much for being here. I am excited to hear about this rock star verdict. You know, you guys are constantly getting rock star verdicts. So I'm excited to hear about another one. I don't know about all of you who are listening, but I tend to at least have one or two dedicated employment lawyers in my KTI edge courses that I teach. And so I'm always excited, you know, we do employment, but we also do PI. So when you're those hardcore employment folks, I love having Amy and David to bounce questions off of and just hear how you guys successfully use the edge in employment cases. So take it away. Start by telling us a little bit about this case and then walk us through how you got this awesome verdict. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. So our case was styled Jackson versus Granberry SNF, which is short for skilled nursing facility. It's a retaliation case, employment retaliation case. We represent a social worker fired after reporting abuse of residents at a skilled nursing facility in Granberry, Texas, a little town of about under 12,000 uh, people. Um, it, it's a, a pretty little town. Um, uh, not particularly um, diverse. It's sort of a um, bedroom community, maybe about 75 miles southwest of Dallas. Um, it, it's, it's pretty in this sense. A lot of Texas towns kind of look alike in that there's a little town square and a courthouse in the center of the square and some shops around it. This one's a little different because there's a lake right next to the town. They've dammed up the Brazos River in uh, in Texas and created this little uh, lake you can see here um, right off the town square. So a pretty little place. Um, not a lot of people. The, like I say, it was under 12,000 people um, uh, population. Um, we sued three entities. Um, one is a company that oversees management of roughly 40 skilled nursing facilities throughout Texas. Another was an operating entity that held the DBA for the location where our client worked as a social worker. And the third was her technical W-2 employer. We joke uh, sometimes that these nursing facilities, uh, nursing homes and skilled nursing uh, facilities, uh, they have so many entities and layers of them. And I sometimes think, gosh, are we going to find that there's an entity for the laundry and an entity for the meals and an entity to, you know, uh, um, to sweep the floors. And, and um, so you have to kind of figure out how uh, the place is operated. Uh, our verdict was for $400,000 in compensatory past compensatory damages and $100,000 in future compensatories. Uh, we did not ask the jury for any economic loss, although there was a little bit there. Um, the jury assessed uh, five million in exemplary damages against the management company, uh, two million against the one that runs the location, and one million against the technical employer. Uh, the defense uh, highest offer at a court-ordered mediation was under uh, one hundred thousand dollars. And right before trial. And yeah, that like, was right before trial. Like, you know, trying to tempt us with less than 100000 right before trial, because, of course, plaintiff's lawyers are so freaking chicken. That's what they think. Yeah, yeah. And we had our, our offer was uh, far north of uh, that number. Um, so a few things. We have a lot of people to, thanks, to thank. You know, KTI is very much a community in and of itself and a village. Um 
uh, B.B. Sanford and Jim Sanford, both um, master KTI master grads, uh, came down to help us with uh, jury selection. Uh, Bijan Darvish out in California, another KTI master grad, uh, helped us with some hard cross-examination in uh, witness prep. You know, we use the KTI witness prep method. Um, and uh, Amanda Hernandez, oh my gosh, she was great. She came up, uh, we said, hey, Amanda, can you come up from Houston and, uh, and maybe help us pick a jury? And she said, yeah, I'll be there. And then she ended up staying two weeks <laughs> for a trial oh, wow. and really helping out from, from things like, you know, getting lunches and that sort of thing for us, but also preparing witnesses, hurting witnesses, um, interviewing, you know, that all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, lots of very substantive stuff and really just was, uh, gosh, <laughs> I just can't say enough good things about her. And when I say came up from Houston, if you realize how big Texas is, um, <laughs> from Houston to Granbury, Texas is a long, long way. Uh, we had an ice storm in the middle of trial yep. and, uh, she stayed throughout. We were all iced in, um, our, our courthouse shut down Monday around noon of the second week. We were hoping to maybe be done by Tuesday evening and, um, no, we shut down Monday around noon. We didn't resume until Friday at around 10 AM. And then the jury came back that Friday evening. So we had a number of days where we're just kind of shut down day to day, not knowing if we're going the next day, the, the county judge would make the call and say, yeah, it looks like we're, you know, still iced in. So, um, so no court tomorrow. And, and that was a little off putting Jenna, you know, because you have the momentum of trial and the emotion and everything going, you're always grateful for more time, right. <laughs> During a trial, but at the same time, you want to keep things. So how, how did you deal with that with experts and things like that and rescheduling witnesses? And, you know, that's my biggest thing. I get so upset with courts when they think that it's just easy to move things around because sure, it's easy for me to move things around myself, but it is not easy for my witnesses. Well, one, one thing, when there's an ice storm in Texas, everybody's shut down. So it's not just the courthouse. No one can get out on the roads. We're just not built for it here in Texas. Oh, yes. we have, you know, we don't we don't have um, salters out on the roads and 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 snow tires and that sort of thing. So when when one place shuts down for a nice storm here, everybody's stuck at home. So that kind of helped with coordinating with witnesses. Uh, my bigger concern was the jury kind of um, maybe losing yeah. them or or having jurors who peel off, you know, you have a trial that goes longer than you expect. Suddenly you might not have enough jurors to finish the trial. But, right. Um, experts might've been a problem. Um, but we didn't use, we didn't have any experts. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, All right. All right. So that, that's the intro and, um, who we have to help, uh, and the community. Um, let me just say this. We, we used KTI, uh, methods throughout, and when there were deficiencies in how we prepared or tried the case, it was primarily where we had not followed our training on KTI as well as maybe we could have done so. You know, there's always things that go wrong in trial, um, but golly, if you have these methods down, you can fix so much and you can do so on the fly. I remember uh, one of my KTI teachers years ago saying, it's like a Batman utility belt, right? You have all these tools you can just throw out and you get to where you master all of them that when things do go wrong, you can use them on the fly. And we were able to do plenty of that. Yeah, Don Keenan talks about the Marine Corps way and we were not exactly always the Marine Corps way. Our troops were falling down sometimes. Um, well, it's good to hear about that too, because the reality of it is we have to keep going back into battle over and over again to make sure that we know how to use these tools, right? And and yeah. to remember, oh, okay, I can grab for this or I can grab for that. But it doesn't come naturally unless you do it multiple times. It doesn't come naturally the first time. It may not come naturally the 10th time, but eventually it will, you know? Yeah, we get, um, I feel like we get better every time. Um, and hopefully that will continue. Uh, I, I do want to say, I don't think David mentioned what Amanda was doing for us most substantively, she was watching the jury. Mm, oh, okay. She debriefed what was hitting, what was not. She would rank what was hitting with mm. them 
and tell us what was not. And so she debriefed every night. That was critical. Um, and maybe we had not talked to every before and after witness mm -hmm. uh, before trial. And so she talked to some DNAs for us and would rank their best stories for us. Oh, wow. That's um, really, really helpful. She's a master grad. She could have tried the case herself. Um, and she spurred other KTI attorneys to say, yeah, I've been practicing 30 years. I'm going to volunteer to get lunch and watch the jury and help somebody else. Yeah. Um, Cause it's so important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when, uh, so by the way, so for those of you who are doing your laundry while you're listening to this podcast later, um, I shared some pretty pictures of Granbury, Texas. It is beautiful. The lake is right there. Go visit Granbury, Texas. If you can, they are kind of a tourist place. Um, but I'm going to share screen and show like you, it sounds like a great case, right? Like, wow, a social worker reports abuse of nursing residents and gets sacked over it. Um, but it didn't, it didn't look that awesome at the beginning. We had to focus group some things to get it right. But what I'm showing right now, this is her, this is a write up that I'm going to show y'all. And so as far as the timing goes, there were outcries about abuse over a weekend by two CNAs, meaning certified nurse assistant. And our client took the reports. She came in even Christmas Eve to finish up her uh, reports and turn them in. And then she was off work. Friday was Christmas. She was off work that Friday, that weekend, and didn't return until the following Monday. And this ride up happens the morning, that Tuesday morning when she comes back. Um, for those who can't see this discipline memo, it's got misspellings. It's got stuff crossed out because they used somebody else's discipline that didn't apply. Um, it's like super sloppy and we didn't focus on this, but we had our presiding wasn't, I don't think she was teaching at the time, but she had teaching in her background or at least she was nicknamed teacher by the jury. And hmm. she, she noticed and look, it wasn't like a huge deal, but they felt like when you're dealing with things this important, you know, they ought to be right. Um, but it did kind of show they were in a hurry. Um, so they say in the violation, David, you have the radio voice. Will you read for listeners what the violation says? Yeah, the description of the violation was this. Performance deficiencies that jeopardize the operation of the community during an investigation, tactics taken to obtain statements from residents and family members was conducted in a bias format which impeded the investigation. Future failure to follow policy and procedure will result in further disciplinary action up to and including termination. So there had been two nurse aides who had come in um, a weekend, very close to Christmas, just before it. Um, they were temporary nurse aides. Um, understaffing seemed to be a problem. The, the temporary nurse aides come from a sister facility uh, um, but not in town. And on the, uh, after the weekend, our client starts hearing about, um, reports of abuse by these nurse aides and starts detailing the reports that she heard. And pretty quickly she is written up for what they say here was conducting, uh, investigation in a bias format right and so we don't need to to read this part but on this right up at the bottom um for those who are watching these are our clients natalie these are natalie's handwritten notes she's saying that that didn't happen she would never jeopardize the operation of the community um no improper tactics 
and how sad it is to her that they're making these accusations. So we get this in and we're like, okay, this is looking good. This is looking good. But then they, we get in the second disciplinary document, same day, same Tuesday morning. It's about eight 30 in the morning when this happens on the second write up, David, will you? Yeah. So the description of violation that they put on this second write up says professionalism during a conversation with the DON, which is director of nurses on 12, 28, 20, Natalie Jackson made the comment quote, they can't even get here on time. What are you doing? Bringing more in so they can abuse our residents all night long. Like the other ones. Future failure to follow policy and procedure will result in further disciplinary action up to and including termination. And as typical with um, write-ups, uh, they leave a space for the employee to comment. And here was her handwritten comment, and I'll read it to you. I did not say they can't even get here on time. I did, however, say hopefully they will not be leaving bruises like the last CNAs. I'm ashamed and embarrassed. I knew it was wrong when I said it. It was an ignorant comment of complete irresponsible and unprofessional. Again, I knew when it came out, it was wrong. It was not at all a reflection of how I view management, specifically Karen, D-O-N, Director of Nursing. Uh, I know her best interest is protecting the residents. This statement was wrong. I am embarrassed and genuinely sorrowful, no excuses, it was wrong. So this, these are our client's own words in response to them saying that she made an inappropriate comment and here's what she says. And so for those of you who don't do employment, you know, you can get fired for any reason or no reason at all, no matter what, as long as it's not an illegal reason. So we get this and we're thinking, well, shit, you know, if, if they really fired her for making an inappropriate comment to the director of nurses, who's above her in the hierarchy, you know, it's not fair probably, but it would be a legitimate reason to fire someone. Had you seen this before? No, no. So we get this in discovery. We, Oh, but like you, but you got it during discovery, not during trial, right? Right. Oh yeah. Or, or okay. We got it early in the case. Okay. Um, there were other attorneys handling the case and it was sent to us. The deadlines are tight on whistleblower mm -hmm. cases to file suit. And so we were just scrambling to figure out who are the proper defendants, who are their agents, mm -hmm. stuff like that, and get the basics down. So we get this and then the termination document is the next day. And it says that she is fired because of the comments um, that she made. And it says, it just says Natalie made unprofessional, inappropriate comments to a leadership team member about another team member, blah, blah, blah. That's the essence of that. And so we're like, well, shit. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, it worried me. That looks bad. <laughs> here she's 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 saying how embarrassed and sorrowful she is for making this comment. She agrees it's inappropriate, and they uh, immediately or within a twenty four hours, you know, fire, and they cite inappropriate comments. So you know, at first blush, you might think, "Gosh, we're cooked. You know, yeah. we're, we're done." So, but here's what we did: we. We do it. You do in KTI. We scheduled a focus group. We only gave the focus group the discipline documents and termination. We just literally put it in front of them and said, tell us what happened. Most focus group members just regurgitate what's on the documents. Like, lady, why are you asking us what happened? It mm -hmm. says on the documents. Here's what surprised us. Several people said, I think there's something else going on here. Hmm. 
Um, I think maybe there's a, was there abuse going on that they weren't telling people about, or they trying to hide abuse? I feel like it's weird that both the, both the discipline documents mention abuse. Um, and so we thought, well, maybe we have a chance. Hmm. So then we did, we did about seven focus groups in total, but three were critical on how we tried the case. Mm -hmm. The second one, we did just like a narrative focus group with the new information. And in, as a little bit of background in our clients abuse reports, the CNAs, first of all, it's COVID. So they've got PPE on over their tags. Only a few people put their ID tags on the outside of the PPE. Mm -hmm. So they, the residents don't know these two women, the two CNAs who came in to fill in over the weekend on night shift. They, um, so they describe them as two black women um, and, you know, like height, weight type of description. The defense ended up, the reason defense was saying that comment was inappropriate was that it was racist. Mm. I um, wondered if it might be when I, when she said that, I was like, you mean them? Like who? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Which, which was actually helpful for okay. us. If okay. they, if the defense said that comment was racist, okay. okay, because what was really going on on the apology is the director of nurses, and I won't get in. It's her story to tell, but she has a mm -hmm. history of abuse. She's very open about, mm -hmm. and she took it personally. Like, are you mm -hmm. saying, Natalie, that I would let knowingly let someone in here? And it ends up at the end of day being that our client's the only one who owned or truly apologized or repented for anything, but it was about hurting mm. her feelings because she'd been abused. Mm. The it's racist. So focus group says, well, it's not right. And she shouldn't have been fired, but you know, that's what happens in this woke culture. Mm -hmm. um, it's cancel culture. And I guess these days, a skilled nursing facility has to fire people for describing people as black. Even the black focus group members were saying, I hate this woke stuff. It's gone too far. And so we thought, well, they're saying she shouldn't have been fired, but that mm -hmm. is a loser of a focus group, right? We're mm -hmm. going to lose our sales. So what we did next was... I showed different, I showed the focus group, the next focus group showed them different abuse reports. And I'm going to show this for people watching, but I showed before and afters because there's some abuse reports that our client did. And there's some abuse reports. Where did Henry go? Is this Henry? So, yeah, we started changing, you know. No, 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 this, sorry, sorry, I got it. Um, so Henry Becker was kind of an honorary resident, but he had a special relationship with his roommate, Jimmy, or Bill, I'm sorry, Billy, who had, who was blind and had um, cerebral palsy. He was, Henry was very defensive of his roommate. So this is the original report that our client Natalie writes about the abuse Henry reported. And what he ends up saying oops, is I'm sorry, I'm skipping to the second part. What he, David wants to interrupt me because he says I'm too much in the weeds. But the reason I'm showing this for those who are watching visually is the difference in our client's report and later reports. They redid the abuse reports after our client was exited out the building. 
had a dramatic impact on the focus group, also had a dramatic impact on the jury. But here in this particular situation, Henry reports that the two CNAs are making fun of his genitals, um, talking about how small his pecker is, laughing at him. So he's blind, but he can hear. Um, and he's reminding them like he, he can hear you. Um, and then they redo all the reports. And this is what the later report says done in January after our client's gone. And look, you can see at a glance. Oh, wow. Okay. Right? All of a sudden there's no problems. All of a sudden, no well, problems are reported like a week later. Although at the bottom, Henry says, these are a waste of time. Even if I said yes, you know, you wouldn't do anything about it. So did they actually interview him a second time and kind of like fudge or, or did they straight up change the report? So at, during trial, what we, we learned something that we didn't know, mm -hmm. which is that they set aside our, they said, we're setting aside Natalie's reports because they were biased. Mm -hmm. They re-interviewed the residents mm -hmm. every single day for a week about Whoa. whether they were abused. And we got testimony that that's highly inappropriate to do to an abuse victim, right? I mean, at a certain point, you're going to be like, "Never mind, nothing happened. Go away. Stop bothering me." <laughs> right. <laughs> cool. And but it also, if you keep asking, it makes them feel like they're not believed. Totally. But what we found out at trial was so we have these what the set our client did that's very detailed, typed out, long documents, a lot of detail, and then these January fifth reports a week later, a week or so later, where there's just like no abuse. Mm -hmm. It came out during trial that the initial redos, we call them redo reports. Mm -hmm. There were defense witness words, redos. Um, <laughs> so they, they weren't done the right the first time. We have to redo them for you. Right. Wow. They were, um, there were initially the redos did corroborate the abuse. Mm. But those were missing at trial from the abuse investigation file. So, so like one witness was like, well, you don't understand. This is not the only report. Mm -hmm. The residents, we did them every day. And the initial reports, they all, the residents did corroborate the abuse mm -hmm. until they gave up. And so we asked her to look at the abuse binder that's supposed to be all the investigation materials very dramatic she looks through it and she says they're not in here there were also things like um defense admitted there were pictures of handprint bruising on one of the residents that disappeared so in any event we only showed a couple of of like the the original and redo abuse reports and focus group said this is a cover-up unanimous so that, that changed your sure. Yeah. yeah. So you want to, you want to lose. Point. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, you want to lose focus groups in some ways mm -hmm. now how yeah. you're going to lose and what you're going to do about it. It, it, it still kind of can break your heart though when yeah. it happens. Right. But they showed us a path forward when we kept mm -hmm. doing this, when we started layering in the abuse and redo reports and that's when sort you did of, the redos. When you yeah. Redo some of them, we didn't, we didn't realize the extent that they were going in every day. Cause a number of those things were missing. Mm -hmm. Um, and another reason why they're important too, is if you go in every 24 hours, it's confusing. Like, are you saying, have I been abused in the last 24 hours since totally. you were yesterday? Right. But totally. bottom line, the focus group showed us the path forward and had started to say, I think this is a cover up. I think mm -hmm. there was abuse and then a cover up of the abuse, and she's getting retaliated against for doing this. And then when we put those write ups in that sort of context with the focus groups, they actually started to have a positive view of the write ups themselves. One of them telling us, Look, she's standing up 
She's saying it was inappropriate because it was the director of nurses who she had said this to, but she's continuing to stand up for residents. Um, and so the, you know, put in the right context, the focus group showed us how um, those write-ups that I feared so much were truly just my fears as a lawyer, mm -hmm. um, but they were not the same that jury, juries had. Right. Um, they took it as uh, she got fired because clearly in that meeting, they wanted her to back down. They offered mm -hmm. her a chance to redo. Do you want to redo your reports, Natalie? And Natalie said no. Um, she was not backing down on the abuse. Um, so that changed everything. It changed our order of proof. It changed jury selection. Mm -hmm. Our very first rule was a cover-up rule. Mm -hmm. Um Everything changed from then on out. It was a cover-up case, similar to try to lie, but the cover-up proves the lie. So what else, Amy, from focus groups on to what? Um, uh, one last thing that was critical on focus groups was they taught us not to point out that our client had fostered any kids who were black until damages oh, yeah. and not to point out that one of her kids is black until we got to damages. Mm. And it was more powerful that way. Um, yeah. And that's real tricky too, because when you see something where say here, the initial write-up mentioned bias, your inclination as a lawyer is to fight head on what they're saying. Right. Mm -hmm. But again, focus groups sort of showed us a better way. Like my inclination might be to say, Bias, racist, wait, are you accusing our client of being a racist? Her son is black. Um, you know, focus groups told me, particularly our black focus group members said, well, that's a little like saying, you know, I can't I be racist because my friend is black. <laughs> yeah. right? And, and yeah. so they, they kind of showed us a better way to do those kinds of things, right? And uh, anyway, the focus groups were so key for us on how to present evidence and fight some of our own inclinations of, well, I just want to address it head on and they would show me a better way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also I know it's different in different parts of the country, but where we are black is the appropriate and preferred term, but we mm -hmm. focus group that as well. They do not, a lot of people do not like being called African American here. That's um, good to know. Yeah. And that's uh, good for that your focus groups can share that with you. So, right. You, know, you gotta make sure you're using the right every little thing can turn the jury off. So all right. these little things are so important. Right. Um, so we took very limited depositions. Um, for those of you who saw the discipline documents and heard it, they're really vague, you know. Um, they're not very specific. And we I wanted them nailed down. Um, before trial, David's like, oh, just take him at trial. I'm like, you. <laughs> I was like, if I'm going to do it, I need to have a little bit of comfort on the direction they might go. And so, as, so some of the things, and it's so fun to do super limited depositions. Yeah, none of our depositions lasted um, about two hours, maybe. Yeah. And we only did maybe three of them. So, and asking about the reports. Um, you know, claiming her reports were biased. The facility administrator, he admitted during, or he said deposition, the question is, which abuse questionnaires do you contend were false? And he says, the interview she made, he's talking about Natalie. And we say, I can't move us out of the way. Okay. And we ask all of them and he says, yes. I mean, like, wow. Mm -hmm. They are saying that all like eight residents who reported abuse by the same people over the same weekend during COVID when everyone's kind of isolated, it's not like they could have all gotten together. Yeah. Shared stories. They hate, hate on the CNAs. So they polarize the case for us mm -hmm. before before we got there. And then on, on the race, on the comment, we nailed down that they were saying it's racist. And so I'm showing where the facility administrator, the questions like, but the allegation as far as this meeting, 
is that Natalie was making a racist statement because the two CNAs that the residents complained about happened to be black, right? And he says, yes. So we got all our people to nail down that it was that the racist was comment, not that the comment was racist, not that it was inappropriate to the director of nurses. Mm. And then this. Yeah, we, and we wanted to nail down what do you mean by bias? It could maybe mean a few things. We thought that maybe they were saying she's uh, being racist, right. that even describing the nurse aides as. Mm -hmm being black was somehow racist. Right. Um, our focus group members who were black um, were uh, all in agreement that this was not racism. Right. Um, although we kind of knew with the demographics of the local community where we'd be trying the case that it was almost certain we would not have any black members in the jury panel. It, uh, the demographics are uh, skewed very, very white in this uh in that community. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we had like no bad demographics yeah. of any type right. by the time we were done with KTI and focus groups. And here's what they said about the redos. we nailed this down before trial as well. And this is just an example of how sometimes how come or why is a good question, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm asking the regional director, why they are redoing the abuse questionnaires. And she says, because you have to make sure it's just like the police interview a rape victim several times. We have to do the same thing to make sure it's consistent. So wow, that's a really odd choice because that's like probably not the person you want to be forcing to tell their story over and over again. Wow. Right. So, um, I mean, y'all, we are in Texas, but our police don't do that kind of thing no. anymore, not even for rape victims. So that's kind of how they were treating their residents. Um, mm -hmm. but, th but that's it. We got a little bit tested, some motive, so a few things we needed. Um, but that was it before trial. Very, very short, very few depots. One lady was against us. Like said, I ain't got nothing to say to you. She was hostile to me. And I was like, you know, she's a nurse. I bet there's a hard oh. somewhere. So I started with the abuse reports, got her to cry. And then mm -hmm. she turned into a favorable witness. So that's kind of the Don Keenan telling us you can't start with a chainsaw and then go in soft. Sometimes mm -hmm. you get more being kind and compassionate. Mm -hmm. So she ended up being pretty good for us. So who are the three people that you deposed just kind of so that we know the, um, director? the facility administrator, okay. the regional director of operations and the director of nurses. Okay. All right. We so the person you're talking about who was, who you got to cry was which one? The director of nurses was sorry. Yeah. I should have said that she was okay. the one who was just super hostile to me. Okay. 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 Um, and she changed. She ended up being a really good witness for us. She was, I thought, an odd witness for us in this sense. She was very good as far as she corroborated all the abuse, how terrible it was. Um, but then she also had some very bad things to say about our client, too. Um, so she was kind of a mixed bag, but uh, Amy handled that like, like Amy says. You, you don't go in with a chainsaw. Um, you can't go from a chainsaw to going soft. She goes in soft, gets the confirmation stuff um, mm -hmm. out first, right? And did, you mentioned, Amy, earlier that she was an abuse victim herself and that she was taking it personally that your client is making these allegations. Did you that um, use she, some of the... <laughs> Sorry. Did you, I just didn't know if you used some of that to kind of soften her up to say like, Hey, you obviously really care about these people. You don't want them to be abused, you know? Right. I, I what was yeah. your tactic on that? Um, my tactic was I started with a person who I knew from the client, that the director of nurses had felt so bad about the abuse that happened mm -hmm. that she sat, the director of nurses sat on the bed with the resident and cried with the resident. So when we, I started with that one, let her 
I let her read everything before I asked a single question. And then I said, you know, Natalie said you were really good with her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you sat on the bed and cried with her, didn't you? You held her, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So yes, mm -hmm. yes. We were hoping that given her history and what she did for a living, that she had compassion in there. Mm -hmm. And it just turned her. Yeah, and it really did um, help put the um, write up where our client had said, I'm embarrassed, this was inappropriate, those kinds of things in context, right? She was embarrassed because she knew about the director of nurses' um, background, and it wasn't how she intended that. And the focus group members told us, yeah, that's, that's you know, uh, that rings true. That, mm -hmm. that all is true. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, at will stuff, you're always so worried as lawyers with at will employment, but you have to remember and trust that jurors view things a little bit differently, right? Mm -hmm. About how strong that evidence is that it was not something unlawful as opposed to really retaliation for reporting the underlying abuse. Right. Um, so then. And, and just, by the way, Jenna, I think we mm -hmm. promised that we'd talk about how KTI helps, like, even before trial. But sure. now, now at trial, um, jury selection, David explained we had great help. People mm -hmm. coming in from out of town to help us. Um, some people having to get up at the crack of dawn because you have to allow for trains. <laughs> <laughs> stoppages uh -huh. and uh, the judge started at like 8 a.m so whoa trial started at 8 8 30 i think 8 30 oh i think we had to be there by 8 a.m to start jury selection at 8 30 yeah. okay and uh train they warn us train delays can take an hour so you gotta leave early to get there wow. um but jury selection we just nothing special about it we use the pie. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that happened in jury selection is we had concentric circles showing the different occupations that have to report abuse, like teachers um, at kindergartens, you know, hospitals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The jury knew that stuff so well that we never used it. It would have been so insulting. Oh. Um, they, they gave better examples in our concentric circles. They knew a whole lot about CNAs. They said stuff like, ah, oh, the people on the night shift, they're always bad. Like, oh, yeah, the filler people. That are facts, yeah. Um, <laughs> they're the reason that they're not the, you know, day shift folks. No offense, everybody, no offense, but, you know, there's yep. the yeah. stereotypes. And um, most of the you know, peremptories were easy because everyone used KTI methods. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like the only like tailored question, it wasn't, it wasn't to weed anyone out. It was to see who was favorable. We knew from focus groups that there were lots of lies, but the bigger issue was they watered down the abuse so much in their reports to state mm -hmm. that it was a lie. So I didn't want to overreach. And so we just talked about like, what are the top things you want your children to learn from you? Hmm. Top two things, or, or if you prefer top two things you learn from your parents and overwhelmingly people said honesty, hmm. truth, honesty, integrity, things like that mm -hmm. um, as top. I would say vast majority said honesty. Oh, good. Um, so you didn't have too many bad people to get rid of. <laughs> well, really, the, I mean, when all else fails, God gives you opposing counsel and the defense witnesses. And really, like, <laughs> it was a shit show of a trial as far as defense lies and how bad it is. I just don't think we could have had a terrible juror. Mm. Um, I'm a little surprised the verdict wasn't higher, but we're in a small town. Well, and on that point, when you mentioned, you know, God gives you opposing counsel, I, I got to tell you, we, I, I had some beef with the opposed lead opposing counsel through discovery. I didn't feel like we were getting everything. 
Um, but he did some really brilliant things at trial, and that is he didn't go with a chainsaw at our clients and some things. I think once he saw the writing on the wall, and had he not been um, as savvy as he was and um, held back on um, being mean and, and, and doing that sort of thing or encouraging his uh, clients when they were um, lying about some things, then, um, you know, or his witnesses, um, I, I think it could have been a higher verdict had he gone harder. I thought it was really pretty genius of him once he kind of saw the writing on the wall there. Yeah. You know what? That's a saying we have, and it didn't in particular apply to, um, defense counsel in this case, it was more defense witnesses in this case that were such a gift to us. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, when his clients wanted to pile on and not only call our client a liar and a racist, and they wanted to say weird stuff, like she somehow stole documents, even though they escorted her out and he just wouldn't let them go there. Yeah. He, didn't, like, he, didn't, he didn't, didn't go down. further and draw more. Of that. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. He cut that, shut that down, which helps. You know, what? we tested a defense, I think it was, I don't know if it's a defense narrative or a defense closing argument in the focus group one time. And the client, the lawyer who had hired us to, to help out and test this thing was like, well, why didn't you make the defenses closing or I can't remember what it was, but she was like, why didn't you make it crazy? Like hard, like yelling at my, my plaintiff and like all this stuff. And I was like, listen, the defense lawyer we are concerned about is not the one who comes out swinging it is the one who is just like we are and, you know, makes people think, hmm, you know, so that's what you want to test with your focus groups is the reasonable defense lawyer or the seemingly reasonable defense lawyer, less the black hat, you know, yeah, <laughs> actually, I guess yeah. they are kind of black hat if they're going that way. So that's just yeah. Whew, harsh. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk, um, let's talk opening for a moment. So um, we did the KTI uh, opening, you know, go to the colleges, learn the KTI opening. Um, it, it, uh, I, it worked really well. I kind of, you know, like all things, I wish I had practiced it a little bit more. I, I delivered it. We had our blow ups and our checklists and our, and our rules. Um, one of the rules fell off my board because I didn't have it Velcroed very well. And Oh, hey, there you go. That's so I was in danger of breaking my own rules. <laughs> and, uh, it went pretty well. Probably one of the better parts of it, I thought, was um, uh, using their defenses in our opening and addressing those things. KTI will teach you where to do it and how to do it and that sort of thing. And, and um, it was really great because as soon as I do that and then the other side gets up with their outline for their opening and they're suddenly saying the things that I've already just addressed. Right. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that worked really well. And to the extent that they added a few things that we had not, that I did not address in my opening because I didn't anticipate Amy just picked up right away within the first witness. I think about 10 minutes into the first witness, she caught him in a whopper of a lie in their opening. And she had sort of reordered on the fly because she had the KTI tools to do it mm -hmm. to get out of our very first witness who was head of housekeeping um, that something that they had just said in their oh, opening all was, was a bad lie. And specifically, they had, they had said, um, well, we were suspicious of these investigations being accurate because one of the people being interviewed had uh, a condition called aphasia and so can't speak. Well, aphasia, aphasia can be varying degrees, right? With some people, you can't speak at all. With others, you can, right? And this uh, person could speak. And so Amy, right out of the gate within the first few minutes said, oh, and you know, so-and-so, and she can speak, right? She has a phaser, she can speak. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this is the head of housekeeping. She's got I no skin did, in the game. But I didn't lead her. I didn't lead yeah. her. Right, right, right. Have you, you talked like, to her? Yes. Mm -hmm. What do y'all talk about? You know, it just became obvious. But so to the extent that some defenses slipped through that I didn't grab an opening, Amy was able to pick up and just crush right out of the gate to show nice everything you just heard out of their opening, we've either dealt with, or we can show you it's a lie right now. Mm -hmm. It's fresh. So our first witness could corroborate the abuse, prove the cover up. She knew some other things. I didn't realize until defense did their opening, she could prove that all their big points in opening were lies. So I switched questioning. On, I mean, KTI teaches you to do this, right? Have a plan B and C. <laughs> if you can, 
if you can switch your order of proof to address the biggest fattest lies and opening. So we switched to have her address those first. The first jur the first jury tears happened on our first witness. Um, we're not getting into like the gory details or the emotion of it, but it was emotional from the very beginning. Oh, yeah. I had trouble um, asking some questions a few times during trial because I got choked up. Mm -hmm. And I'm having trouble getting the next question out of my mouth. Um, I remember the first one was when I was asking their witnesses about if they thought about the betrayal, you know, the trust those residents put in them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of thing. And for some reason, it just got me thinking yeah. about it. Um, head of housekeeping was our first witness. Just KTI teaches you to think about your order of proof, right? Just don't do it wrote. Turns out head of housekeeping at skilled nursing facilities, they, they're they like everyone's right-hand man. Um, they know the residents. They know all of them. They know what's going on. So she was a safe witness who could get the abuse uh, cover-up story out. And I felt bad for her because she had never seen the documents submitted to state, right? The stuff mm. has to be reported. The facility administrator and regional director had just lied to state, mm. covered up, lied, watered down. It was terrible. The, our first witness was crying, saying she used to really like the facility administrator. I asked her when she changed her mind. She said, today, she's bawling. She's like, I did not have any idea they did this. Wow. And um, you had, you, you hadn't talked to her before or had you? I had talked to her on a limited basis. Okay. I knew she knew about cover up. I knew, um, I knew she would testify that absolutely our client was fired for reporting the abuse. Mm -hmm. She, uh, so I knew a lot, but I didn't know everything. Yeah. And KTI will, will teach you this too. You know, um, what happens when you have, like Amy mentioned, a really big lie or some whoppers of lies? And, you know, your first inclination is, well, all my cases have that. You know, there's always a lie that I'm finding, right? But KTI will teach you how to really spot a really important one or not, and it may not be the one that you think is, right? And what you do with that sort of information, how it might change your order of proof on what mm -hmm. um, you might otherwise do. So mm -hmm. all that was was really valuable. So, um we called another neutral witness as our second witness, more tears, more tears from the jury. And the first defense witness, like normally you have some moments in trial where kind of the air is sucked out of the room. There's a huge lie or a huge moment. Defense witnesses lied so much that with their very first witnesses, jurors were starting to turn their backs to them. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, to a point that later in trial when defense counsel said, Amy, you told me you were going to do X, Y, and Z, and you didn't. And I said, I didn't think I needed to. And he said, is that because you knew you won last week? <laughs> so, I mean, was, was his advice to his client to, like, take this to trial? Or, or was he just held hostage by them? Or what do you guys we think? Don't we don't know. But we don't we, know. We did, we did notice, or I noticed, um, the objections started coming a little more strenuously and maybe to preserve a deal or something like that. Um, but so after the first witness head of housekeeping, there was director of nurses, there was another nurse and she was, I thought, one of the most charming <laughs> witnesses. Oh, Natalie Wright. Yeah, she was saying how, and she's got this great Texas accent and she was saying, well, you know, y'all, there's a lot of relationships at the skilled nursing facility. <laughs> Everyone got a kick out of that. Like between the residents? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Lots of, there's a lot of dating going on there. Yeah. Oh, they're so cute. And so she's just, you know, just charming as all get out. And, uh, but, you know, sticks, sticks to um, uh, what we thought, you know, although she told us a number of things that we didn't know before about missing reports, for example, you know, in their investigation binder and what was being reported documents today and that, that sort were, of thing. Documents um, that were missing, their witnesses would say things like, um, defense witnesses, not our wonderful nurse. Mm -hmm. uh, abuse is, 
abuse is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, you know? that was that was their one of their main witnesses. They said abuse is in the eye of the beholder. I thought, what in the world? And what does that even mean? about things like leaving people sitting in their own urine and feces for many, many hours to where it's spilling on the floor, um, depriving people of water, humiliating them, leaving handprint bruising. And she's like, yeah, well, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. Well, dang, that person certainly doesn't know about mandatory reporting because what's she going to report? I mean, if you don't know what the standard is for reporting, that's terrifying. Um, Right. You know, our clients' reports were detailed and then the redos showed nothing. The facility administrator would say things like, "She, our client was being too extra. Mm. All right. And thanks to teaching KTI, I know what extra means for some people. <laughs> it's the first time someone said, Amy, I hope I'm not being too extra. I was like, okay. Extra what? <laughs> thank, thank goodness for the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> to look it up. So we ask about that. Like, do you, what do you mean? Like overly dramatic to emotional? He's like, no, she literally wrote down too much extra stuff. Oh, they great. didn't want her going into that much detail on the abuse. Um, uh, my favorite cards were from David that would say, I don't know if y'all can No, you can't see that. No, it's not showing up. We take notes on index card, but it says, it's basically like David hands me a note and says, objection, boring, move on. Uh, yeah. So keeps us um, doing that. One of their witnesses was so strange. David, what did you see her doing? Oh, um, so the, we put kind of the, the main bad guys in sort of the middle of the trial. And they were very long witnesses um, in the sense that, you know, we would tell some whopper and we've got to unwind it. Right. Um, but one of them would like, there's a main exhibit. We called it exhibit one. It was the investigation binder. And she kept kind of shuffling the papers around in there. And so it was very weird. On purpose. Yeah. Like, like, what are you, what are you hoping to accomplish by mixing up the exhibit somehow? It was, it was very odd, but, uh, like she was opening the binder, like the rings and well, we, we don't, we, we, we have them kind of loose, not in the rings we themselves. Don't the rings. We don't use rings because oh, okay. buy a little tip. it takes we don't, too long. We don't like all the click, 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 click of yeah, the clicks, yeah. hundreds of documents in a case and you're click, click, clicking click, click, all the time click. and it's low and it's a little bit annoying. Right. And so we yeah. just have a rubber band around them and kind of keep them a little loose where we can with tabs, with tabs so, so we they can, can get to them. But yeah, she kept kind of just shuffling it on the stand. It was very strange. Just so. supposed to want you guys to be thrown off, right? Right. Like, well, oh, like, yeah, exhibit four. I'm not oh. sure. Or other witnesses, because we had our own. I yeah. mean, we yeah. had you, we used a document camera, but opposing mm-hmm. counsel must have noticed it because they're like, we redid a new exhibit <laughs> one for y'all because it kind nice. of got messed up yeah. on the stand. Right, I think right. they knew. Yeah. The same lady, one of the director of nurses who ended up being pretty good for us was waiting out in the hall. The judge has sworn people in the rule is invoked right before the director of nursing is going to testify. The regional director offers her a job. Yeah, it was odd out in the, in the hallway, hallway yeah. of the courthouse. Yeah, yeah. I like think- were there jurors there? Uh, no, but, the out there. but yeah. we brought it. So we questioned about that. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't think it was that huge of a deal. Whew, mm-hmm. The jury thought that I was like so it. juicy. They did not like it. Yeah. Whoa. So it was just, it was just bizarre. Um, the emotion was with us every single day. Our client we had before and after witnesses. Like, I don't think... I was, I was crying on the before stories. Uh, oh man! Um, oh, can I can I tell a story so um, about uh, standing for the objections? Oh, <laughs> so, so, so yeah, about let, wait, let me tell but, the story. But, so, but front load with trust that even if you mess up, it's okay, right? The jurors yeah. like you, yeah. and they will communicate and di- that to you in different ways. Yes. Yeah, so here's. Um, 
It's a very Baylor law thing, right? Amy went to Baylor law, the judge there, it was a Baylor law guy, right? And one of their big practice court things, Baylor law is kind of known as the Marine Corps of law schools for trial lawyers, right? They have a really super mean intensive, you know, trial advocacy course that you have to do in your first year. And they're just really known for it. And so one of their big things is you always stand for an objection, right? You always have to stand for an objection. Well, the way this courtroom is laid out, we're right next to the jurors, right? At the prosecutor's we're looking table. Left. And we're looking a little bit left. The judge is up left. here. The witness is kind of to our left here. Mm -hmm. And the defense lawyers are way over here over to the right and a little bit behind us. So it's kind of hard to see them standing up for an objection. And when they stand, they're away from the microphone. So sometimes you can't hear it very well. And so when they object, you're supposed to stand and um, stand for their objection and then address it. And you kind of had to be quick because sometimes this judge would maybe sustain or overrule or mm -hmm. sustain before you can get a response into the record. Right. And um, I kept kind of tapping Amy's elbow. Amy, they're, they're, you know, because I could kind of see them a little no bit. And I would tap her on the elbow. Amy, yeah. you need to stand up. You need to stand it's up for an objection. Like right. Yeah, they, they yeah. kept laughing because I kept uh, doing that sort of thing because she couldn't see. And then one time it was weird because they stood up and I'm tapping Amy. And by the time she looks over, they're seated back down and she's like, what is going mm. on? But she kept um, the judge once or trip. twice with Miss Gibson. You need to stand for the objection. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was he was a, nice. a very uh, good tempered uh, judge. And he was right. right. Which is always nice. Right. Um, mm. <laughs> but at one point. Amy goes over to the other side's table because we're trying to reach some sort of an agreement on a document. On objection, right? we're addressing their potential objections to some pictures. To, to, yeah, to some pictures that we wanted to show, and so, um, so Amy's over at their table, but standing, the, standing, but <laughs> and and the lawyers are seated over there. One of the jurors behind us says, "Well, stand for the objection." Oh, they felt uh, like Amy had been getting picked on and now they needed to stand for the objection. Yes, stand right? for the objection, folks. Yes, yeah. So the juror was kind of communicating yes. in a way like, hey, we got your back, right? Yes. Or like, you know, fair's fair, right? If you're getting in trouble, then they should have to stand as well. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that's when you're like, yeah, I think that juror is probably with us. Yeah. yeah. Um mm -hmm. nice. Uh and so I'm just checking time. We're just at the end. So if you guys are, you know, we're ish couple minutes, if you want to wrap up a little bit or if you had final um, things. I just, uh, um, I, I will share some pictures and, and why we use them. Like the damages testimony was powerful. Um, the judge wanted us to shut it down because our client was coming across as a saint and he was right. He was probably, I was like, Oh shoot. If we, mm -hmm. if there's much more of how awesome our client is from B and A's, we might be in trouble, but instead of t discussing that, like her kid is black um, or how much it hurt her to be branded as racist, we would show pictures like, what I'm showing is a picture of what was up at work. Those are her children. And you can see that there's different races in there, right? But we mm -hmm. never said we treated all the kids normal, like kids. Like, who is this? Oh, that's Jude. Who is this? That's, mm -hmm. that's wrong. It's not like we never said things like you have a black child who's the black child kind of thing. Right. Right. Or did that make it worse when this happened to you or any like, just yeah. let that speak for itself. And we had not, I haven't taken direct exam yet, but we did not practice with the client. I knew a lot about her. She had an idea, but I remember I'm blowing up, um, for those watching, she's got a little verse from Ecclesiastes that says he has made everything beautiful in its time, I asked her what that meant. And she was in tears. She said, cause she had, she adopts, um, as well as ha has biological kids. Mm -hmm. And she said, it's just how these kids start out and look at how beautiful they all are in their different ways. Mm -hmm. Or like another one, that's her son, Ezra. 
talking to a lady who just fell in love with him as a customer where he works and wanted to go to his graduation. Oh, um, and I didn't necessarily, I picked the pictures. We had a ton ready. Um, and there were stories behind each of them, but that we were very subtle on the racist, you know, very subtle on how we handled that and used pictures. And like So Natalie yeah. was, uh, I think our last witness and usually, you know, we, yeah. we might um, sometimes want to put on our plaintiff a little bit sooner. We, uh -huh. we, the way things worked um, with scheduling in the ice storm and that sort of thing, we needed to end with our uh, plaintiff. Yeah, it, it was very emotional. I'm sorry, I'm showing. I'm that's so cute. Forcing. So defense, actually, I, that's adoption day, two of her kids. And defense, I said, do you have objections? I, I only picked a few. I picked five. Do you have any objections? He's like, we give me a minute. All I can think of right now is too much cuteness. Yeah. Going, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but because she fosters, there's some stereotypes that um, you only do it right. People only do it for the money. So mm -hmm. we address that through pictures as well. Mm -hmm. I'm skipping mm -hmm. this one. That's family. This picture is our client with a little baby. That's the baby. She, after that baby, she stopped because mm -hmm. the family got that baby back after she had him for a year and it broke her heart. So that kind of showed she's like not doing this just for the money. And then another example in this picture, there's a girl, you can see she's like a teenager. Our client had her as a young kid for a few years before she got adopted. And that kid loved our client so much that she kept in touch and hung out with their family even oh, wow. years later. So. And she, yeah. our, our client did so well um, in her testimony. Um, she was able to tie in the things you learned through the Canaan system about passions, what her passion was at the end to kind of thread that through the symphony from the beginning to the end. Um, the passion was and, people. Uh, and helping people. She was very well prepared, but you know, these weren't stories that were rehearsed or anything. Right. And, and that kind of came across too, because Amy might have to trigger. In fact, she, Amy drew an objection, like you're leading and, and Amy had to go show the rule judge. I'm allowed to I'm lead, allowed to, lead to, to start a story, to develop testimony, to trigger a memory of a story. And, uh, and that worked um, really well. Any surprises with her testimony? I was surprised at how good it was. Witness prep is great. Number one rule, you do not tell your client what to say. Yeah. When I said, how did it hit you when you're in the suspension meeting and people who, are, who know there was abuse, who know you told the truth, didn't stand up for you? Mm -hmm. She's in tears and says, that's not it. That's not it. Nobody stood up for those residents. They are people. They have lives. They had high school sweethearts. They snuck out of the house as kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it was so powerful, too. And it wasn't rehearsed or anything. But for her to say, when we're trying to, frankly, we're kind of asking questions that might draw out how it would affect her. And she is still thinking about okay. those residents and how it how worried she was for those residents when she's escorted out of the building after these people had poured out their hearts to her about the abuse that had gone on. And then she's gone, you know, yeah. after she had said, I'm going to take care of you. Yeah. You know, those she's kind their of advocate. She's yeah. Kind of right. 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 And, um, and she's still, still afterwards worried about them when we're clearly asking about how did this affect you? No. <laughs> No one's getting it. I'm, I'm trying yeah. to protect them. You know, yeah. it's them that I'm worried about, right? Biggest, it's really powerful. The biggest harm to her was that she was escorted out and she had gone to the residents and said, had them pour their hearts out. She said she would take care of it. And then she's gone. They think she betrayed. Yeah. So yeah. she's having to live with yeah. the notion yeah. that yeah. these yeah. folks. And but. then, um, Look, closing, great stuff, even though I had to cut it down to 25 minutes after a two-week trial, including rebuttal. Wow. Um, oh, shoot. Wow. But it's the ice storm. We start late on Friday, but, and the judge needs to be done kind of that evening. But look, she was young attorney, okay? So 
like, she's really good. She'll be a great attorney. I have great things to say, but she started defense closing with, I told you they try to make this about abuse. Yeah. This case is not about abuse. And then the notebook where it was clear there were documents missing, um, stuff, there were lies, et cetera. She took that binder and dropped it on the table and it was super loud. And Brian Sanford, a KTI attorney was there and he hadn't been in trial. And he said, I don't know what's in that notebook, but I can tell that did not go over well with the jury. It made him angry. Yeah. He called our checklist a wish list, even though we'd proven it 10 out of 10 overwhelming evidence. And they tried to adopt our language because <laughs> I kept saying like, but you know, you don't need to consult your regulations. This is dirt simple. We're talking about basic abuse here, right? Mm -hmm. They tried to say like the simple truth is, but here's the problem. If you're going to say the simple truth is, it's got to be simple. And it's got <laughs> to be the truth. <laughs> Yeah, they um, and we were able to. Um, I thought pretty effectively use their HR director. I'm sorry, David. And um, I, I had kind of built on the fly a um, in front of her under our document camera a list of red flags for retaliation. She agreed with all of them, and I think they all existed in our case. You know, you invoke the rule, and they don't know what the other witnesses have said, but the other witnesses had said all these things existed, and I get her. And I, and I literally build a piece of paper with little red flags saying, would firing someone a week after, you know, they report abuse, would that be a red flag that maybe there's retaliation going on, right? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, um, that worked really effectively to build that exhibit right there, build that demonstrative right there uh, during the examination of all these red flags for retaliation that existed in the case that they agreed with. Um, as soon as David got them all out, we'd already proven them all. Mm -hmm. And so I think the jurors were looking at David like, like they are done. Um, mm -hmm. Like you got her, but as soon as that happened, I thought, oh shit, she doesn't know. David proved a second cover up. They did not tell the HR, the HR person yeah. about yeah. any of the stuff that had gone on. In wow. fact, HR said it was a different document, didn't look like any of the stuff, didn't mention anything about abuse at all mm -hmm. or the abuse investigation. It was just about what a big racist she was. So David got a double cover up. Wow. It, it worked pretty effectively. And just to wrap up, so the um, the jury uh, gets the case late Friday. Remember, we got a late start on Friday after the ice storm. The judge has some criminal things that are backed up that are going to start Monday. We really needed to be done that day. Um, we tend to think it's a defense lawyer's dream. They always want to end late on a Friday because it's easy for a jury to write no to the first question and go home, right? That's quick. Mm -hmm. um, and so constantly we're having defense lawyers want to end around three or four o'clock. Here, I think the jury got the case at around four or five. They were back within an hour. Than, um, they announced they had a verdict in less than an hour. They didn't look at a single exhibit. The exhibits had not even gone back to them yet because yeah. the court reporter had to check and verify. That's the power of KTI. People are yeah. getting fast verdicts, yeah, big verdicts, good verdicts, um, and even without it was good, yeah, without any debate or them needing to look at a single exhibit. You know, and KTI just kind of rewires your brain sometimes. I think because you know um, it felt so good what we were doing here. A lot of it, you know, we were able to handle surprises. We were able to handle things using all the KTI tools that we had. Um, and then even at the end, you know, it would have been a dream to me 10 years ago to think in a single plaintiff employment case, you could get an eight and a half million dollar verdict. And now it's kind of like, we're like, yeah, how can we do we better? Should. We should. Yeah, you're like, huh, you should have us more. <laughs> no. Right, right, right. No, we were very grateful. No, we were very we, grateful. We were uh, not expecting a verdict that high. We really were not. But then once it happened, you're like, how can we do better? Yeah, and, that's um, pretty much it. Is we're like, oh, I wonder if you do this. And you no, do we this. love we love the jurors. They came out. They were um, fantastic. One lady was masked the whole time, mm -hmm. even 
unmasked and came up and gave big hugs and kisses like your grandma who's proud of oh, you, you know when you give you a kiss so it was great it was it was fun speaking with them afterwards in the hallway and uh yeah it was it was really heartwarming we we had a few moments out there in the hallway and uh so anyway, um, well, that's that's how we used KTI stuff. We used a lot of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> much of it. And um, Amy teaches KTI, we should say. Amy teaches mm -hmm. trial and witness prep and mediation. And uh, I'm a master grad. I teach employment. Um, and we have an employment, um, uh, our annual KTI employment thing coming up in June. So, you know, y'all look for it. Yeah. Keep your eye out, everybody. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for being here Thanks, again. Anna. And thank, thank you, you to everybody who is watching, listening. I apologize again that this wasn't live, you know, real life happens. And, you know, I think it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't been more than six months ago that something like this, we're having to record instead of be live would have driven me absolutely nuts. And, you know, as trial lawyers, we have to be ready to work with what we have. We have to be ready to move forward no matter what happens. And we were able to do that today. Thank you, Amy and David for being flexible, for being willing to stay a little bit longer outside our scheduled time to get this recorded so we can get it out to the people. Those of you listening, watching, Watching, give it a thumbs up, like it. I don't know what you do on Spotify or Apple, whatever, follow us. And um, we'll have some more good stuff coming up. I think the next couple of weeks are going to be replays. I'm heading into some really heavy deposition stuff and Unfortunately, some of them had to be scheduled on Fridays um, in a trial. So I am not going to be here with you live for a few weeks, but we will come uh, come back in a few weeks with David Stradley. So make sure to keep an awesome. eye out for that. Um, thanks again, Damien David. Can't thank you enough for being here. Congratulations on your verdict and see you all next time. Have a good weekend, y'all.